All right, so we're going to start talking about the bronchi and the alveolar sacs, but let's start first with a little bit of review. So we've got the larynx here, the epiglottis, hyoid bone, tracheal, uh, thyroid cartilage, excuse me, cricoid cartilage, rings of tracheal cartilage, and then the right and left main bronchus. And then notice that the right main bronchus splits into one, two, three uh, lobar bronchi. Those uh, send air to the three lobes. In the left main bronchus, there are only two lobes. So we only have two lobar bronchi, this one and this one. Okay, and then those branch into segmental and those branch into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller bronchi. At the end of each of those, the smallest branches are called uh, bronchioles, and those end in these little alveolar sacs. So what we're looking at here is an alveolar sac with the connective tissue cut away. So we can see inside the sac to see these little bunches of alveoli. The bronchioles themselves uh, are lined with just a columnar epithelium or cuboidal epithelium. They don't have cartilage in the walls. And so that's how you're going to recognize the difference between bronchi and bronchioles. Bronchi have cartilage. The bronchioles also have smooth muscle wrapped around them. That's going to enable them to do bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. The terminal bronchioles uh, are the end of the conducting pathway. After that, we get to respiratory bronchioles, which remember, do a little bit of gas exchange. Not much, a little bit. When the uh, smooth muscle around the bronchioles constricts and the lining of the bronchiole becomes swollen and inflamed, that's what an asthma attack is. Uh, so asthma actually causes bronchial constriction and uh, the swelling of this layer we call the submucosa. So the inner layer is the mucosa, makes the mucus. The submucosa then, if it gets swollen and inflamed, it's going to um, make the airway smaller. This is the only part, the bronchioles are the only parts that are affected by asthma. The bronchi, remember they're held open by cartilage. They can't narrow. They can't get wider or narrow where they can only stay one size. Asthma is gonna narrow this airway. And so when someone has an asthma attack, it feels like they can't get air into their lungs. And the reason is that, well, they can't get air into their lungs because their airways are literally narrowed to the point that not enough air can go in. In a very severe asthma attack, the, to attack, the bronchioles can actually close off. Um, and in that case, a person could actually die from lack of oxygen. The treatment is inhaled steroids that force the smooth muscle to relax. People with chronic asthma need to take uh, things like Benadryl that uh, prevent the submucosa from having this attack in the response to uh, histamine, an antihistamine, stops histamine from forming, which is a signaling molecule for the immune system, which you will learn more about in physiology class. Now, the alveolar sac, like I said, the terminal bronchioles branch into respiratory bronchioles, and those are these little tiny ones. They've just got these small bands of smooth muscle, and they carry the air into the alveolar sac. As they reach the alveolar sac, they branch into alveolar ducts that connect the little alveoli. Think of this as like the little branches um, and these as sort of a bundle of grapes. They're obviously not grapes, they're a little different, but it's that same kind of layout where these ducts branch a bunch so that we have tons and tons of little alveoli. The alveolar ducts have a wall of simple squamous epithelium and each one ends in a group of alveoli. 
each of the alveoli is only about a half to a quarter of a millimeter in diameter. So these things are tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, the wall is one cell thick, and each one is wrapped in a capillary bed, which are also, you remember, tiny, tiny, tiny. So that, and remember that the capillary bed is where gas diffusion actually happens. So the pulmonary artery branches, 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 branches into arterioles that supply blood to the capillary bed where it gets oxygenated by the air uh, diffusing across the wall of the alveolus. And then the oxygenated blood travels through a venule that carries it to a branch of the pulmonary vein that then carries it back to the heart. Now each alveolus wrapped in a capillary bed and also wrapped in elastic fibers. Now you remember, the important thing about elastic is not that it expands, it's that it contracts back to its original shape. So these elastic fibers are going to um, pull the alveoli back to their original shape after they've been stretched. Now I want you to think for just a moment back to the part of the lecture about the pleura. Remember that the parietal pleura is attached to the thoracic wall, visceral pleura is attached to the actual lung tissue, and as the rib cage expands and the diaphragm contracts, the lungs expand. But which tissue is it? Which part of the lungs is it that's actually expanding? Well, it's not the bronchi. They can't. They're held in place and into their shape by cartilage. The bronchioles, they can expand and contract with the movement of this smooth muscle, but that's relatively slow. The expansion and contraction of the lungs happens because the alveoli themselves stretch. So when we say that your lungs are stretching, what we actually mean are the, the alveoli themselves are becoming larger, they're stretching, and then as your lungs contract, the elastic fibers around the alveoli pull them back so that they regain their original shape. That's how your lungs actually expand and contract. Now the tissue in the lungs is pretty identifiable. Um, you can see that we have individual squamous cells here making little alveoli. There's an alveolus, here's an alveolus. We've got alveolar ducts making these big spaces, and then a respiratory bronchioles making even larger spaces. You can also see that we've got some blood vessels passing through here, carrying blood into and out of these spaces. Some of these may actually be blood vessels as well. This is an electron micrograph, so you can really see up close the spongy tissue most of your lungs are actually air. Now, you should be able to recognize this tissue on a microscope slide on the test, because it's mostly air. And notice, in it, the one thing you might confuse it with is adipose tissue. But adipose tissue has really distinct individual round cells, and here we don't see that. Here we see groups of squamous cells, and you can see the individual nuclei here. So yes, you absolutely should be able to recognize lung tissue on the exam. Uh, let's pause there, and I'm going to do some more lung histology in the next section, and then we'll go into lung pathologies.